Good evening. Our next unit is going to be the kinetic theory of gases. The standards that we will cover are obtain, evaluate, and communicate information about the kinetic molecular theory to model atomic and molecular motion in chemical and physical processes. We will construct an explanation using a heating curve as evidence of the effects of energy and intermolecular forces on phase changes, and develop and use models to quantitatively, conceptually, and graphically represent the relationships between pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of moles of a gas. From our introduction to gases activity in class yesterday, we focused on the kinetic molecular theory, which states that matter is in constant motion and that motion has consequences. So when we were identifying some of those basic properties for gases, we talked about the fact that they have an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume, which means that they will uniformly fill any container that they're put into. They will mix completely with any other gas. So you'd have a homogeneous mixture, and they will always exert pressure on its surroundings based on the number of collisions that are occurring with the container walls. We focused on four measurable properties of gases in our activity. We looked at the changes in pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of moles. We'll begin looking at the variables that affect gases with pressure. Pressure is defined as the amount of force per unit area. It's based on the number of collisions that are taking place with the container walls. The SI unit for pressure is what we call the Pascal. It is defined as one Newton per meter squared. So you can write it as one Newton over meter squared. Again, Newton being the unit of force, meter squared being the unit for area. For our standard atmospheric pressure, we know that the gases will exert a pressure of 101,325 pascals. That's a really, really large number. So being a metric prefix, we also can use a very easy 101.325 kilopascals instead. So you can use either of those. There are some other ones you guys are probably familiar with, pounds per square inch. There are 14.7 PSI, pounds per square inch, that are found in one atmosphere as well. Uh, if you are a meteorology fan, like to watch the hurricane hunters and all of that, you'll see them talk about it in terms of bars and millibars. So you have that as a unit of pressure as well. In the old days, we used to measure the pressure using a barometer. A barometer uses the atmospheric pressure to push down on a tub of mercury. Again, this tub here, as you can see in the picture, is open to the atmosphere right here. And so as the atmosphere changes the amount that it's pushing with that force, the column of mercury inside of this little tube with a vacuum up on the top will adjust either up and down to balance out the force of gravity pulling it down with the pressure of the air pushing it up. In the lab situations, we use a device called a manometer to measure pressure for a reaction that is taking place. When we look at this, we have a pressure uh, for a gas that is inside of a chamber, and then we have mercury that is found on the inside, and then we have the atmospheric pressure that is pushing down through this open end at the top. And as the atmospheric pressure is changed, the amount of pressure that is equalizing the pressure inside the container will adjust the mercury level up and down. So you're able to determine the amount of air pressure that is found inside of the chamber by simply subtracting the height. One of those units that we had was 760 millimeters of mercury equaling one atmosphere. So if you measure the height of the difference in the column of mercury, if the mercury in the open side, the one that's open to the atmosphere, is pushed further down, than the mercury on the side with the closed chamber, then we know that the atmospheric pressure is pushing with a greater force than the pressure of the gas inside of the cylinder. And so as a result, we could take the normal atmospheric pressure that we have measured in the lab and subtract the difference in the height, and that will tell us the pressure inside of the container.
if we have a situation like in the second diagram in B, where now the atmospheric pressure side is higher, then that means that the gas inside of the cylinder is exerting a greater force than the outside atmospheric pressure. So I could take the atmospheric pressure again and simply add the height to give me the pressure inside of the chamber. So now let's look at a couple of conversion problems. One of the things that you will have to be able to do, just like everything else that we did with the moles, is make conversions between different units. The atmosphere is our base unit, kind of like the mole is when we were talking about our mole conversions earlier. So if I have Tor and Pascals, again, we had a relationship 760 Tor. The Tor is the same thing as a millimeter of mercury. It was named in honor of Evangelista Torricelli, who is the person that invented the barometer back in the 1600s. And then we have the Pascals, which we said was 101,000. 325. So as we set up our problems here, I would have 2.5 atmospheres, and I know that each of these are the equivalent of one atmosphere, so I'm going to place atmospheres in the denominator to get the unit to cancel, and then I would have 760 tor in the numerator, and if we multiply that out, let's see what we get. We will end up with 1900 tor. That's very good one there. And then if we do the same thing, 2.5 atmospheres, and we say one atmosphere being 101,325 pascals. The atmospheres again cancel, leave me with pascals, and we would get with two significant figures approximately 250,000. Pascals. In this first example problem, we have the vapor pressure over a beaker of hot water is measured as 656 torr. What is the pressure in atmospheres? So in this case, we have the initial unit being different. So we're going to start with 656 torr. And we know that there are 760 torr in one atmosphere. So if we take 656 divided by the 760, we end up with 0.863 atmospheres. And so our answer would be B. So we're now going to start looking at the simple gas laws. You probably learned about them in eighth grade physical science. Uh, with all these different variables, typically you have those four variables that we had mentioned, pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of moles, uh, you're going to have two of them being held constant while the other two are compared. For that comparison, you're going to change one of the variables and measure how that change, again, your independent variable, will affect the other constant uh, value. So when we look at this, uh, Boyle's Law is going to be measuring the relationship between pressure and volume. And we're going to hold temperature and the number of particles, or the moles, constant. If you remember, this is the graph that you were trying to create in that introductory activity the other day, where you were looking at the gas inside of the pipette bulb as you stacked books on top of it. So what we can look at here is the pressure versus volume relationship equaling some constant K. And that constant K at the specific temperature and uh, number of particles will be the same for any of the points along the way. Now, one of the problems that we have here, however, is if you notice with our graph off to the side, we notice that we have an exponential decay function rather than a linear function. And so as we go through this, we can see the relationship as we increase the pressure, the volume is decreased, or as we decrease the pressure, the volume increases as well. So they are inversely proportional to each other. And that's one of the main components that we have to realize. But what we can do is we could change the variables and do one over the pressure versus the volume. And if we do one over pressure versus volume, that will give us a nice linear graph. And so as a result of that, any two points along that graph 
would have the same relationship of pressure times volume. So when we look at this, being able to have the same K, it allows us to set up an equation, P1 V1 equals P2 times V2. Now, this was named in honor of Robert Boyle. He was an English physicist, did a lot of um, pressure volume experimentation, and basically he studied the uh, pressure relationships with a trapped gas. So he had a gas inside of this little chamber here, and he added different amounts of mercury and saw how the pressure was changed inside of that glass tube, how the volume would change as a result. And so he came up with that concept that as you increase the pressure, the volume of those gases would decrease. You saw that also with the little Cartesian diver in that little uh, simulation activity that we did in class yesterday. Uh, you squeezed on the on the um, the bottle and it applied the pressure throughout the liquid, Pascal's principle from uh, physics, and it caused the pressure on the gas to increase and it would shrink as it went up inside of the little medicine dropper and eventually that buoyant force was not enough to keep it afloat, and so it sank. So now let's look at an example Boyle's Law problem. If we have a sample of helium gas occupying 12.4 liters at 23 degrees Celsius and 0.956 atmospheres, what volume will it occupy at 1.20 atmospheres, assuming that the temperature stays constant? So in this type of situation, Notice here, I have two values for atmospheres and I have one for volume. I do have a value for temperature, but because the temperature stays constant, I know I can ignore that. So I would have P1 V1 equals P2 V2. So I can plug my values in. Just make sure you link the two together correctly. The 12.4 liters is connected with the 0.956 atmospheres. So I'd have 0.956 ATMs. I would have 12.4 liters, and that will now equal 1.20 atmospheres times the second volume. So if I take these values and I divide them by the 1.20 for my liters, we will end up with a volume of 9.88 liters. Okay, so our next gas law is Charles' law, and Charles' law shows the proportionality between volume and temperature at a constant pressure and number of particles. So in this case, instead of being inversely proportional, we now have a direct proportion. Just in case you don't remember, from a mathematical standpoint, whenever you have your variables being divided, like we see here, V1 over T1 equaling V2 over T2, that tells you that they are directly proportional. So as one goes up, the other would go up to keep the proportionality the same. If they're inversely proportional, as one goes up, the other must go down. So when we look at the Charles law, again, we have a linear function that will occur from our graph where we have volume on the y-axis, we have temperature on the x-axis. As we increase the temperature on the gas, you can see from that positive slope, that we would have a larger volume. So when we look at this, the one key thing we have to do is make sure that the Kelvin temperature is being used. The reason being, if I have a negative temperature initially in Celsius, then that could translate to potentially having a negative volume when you solve that proportionality, which is impossible. So you need to remember the lowest temperature we can possibly get to is absolute zero, which would be zero Kelvin, negative 273 degrees Celsius. So you can use those in the equation, always temperature in Kelvin, and you'll be able to solve. Okay, so we look at our next exercise here. We have a balloon containing 1.3 liters of air. So again, since I see the liters, I know that is a volume, 24.7 degrees Celsius. So I know that's my temperature placed into a beaker containing liquid nitrogen at negative 78.5 degrees Celsius. What will be the volume of the sample of air at 
constant pressure. So again, same thing here. I have a constant pressure, fixed amount of gas because the balloon is tied off. And so I can change the volume based on the change in temperature. So the first thing that we need to do is convert our temperatures into Kelvin. So I would take 24.7 and I would add 273 to that. And that would give me 297.7 Kelvin. And then for the second temperature, I have negative 78.5 plus the 273. So in that case, I would have 194.5 for my Kelvin temperature for T2. So now I can take 1.30 liters for V1, divide it by the 297.7 Kelvin for my T1. And that's equal to V2 over 194.5. And I can cross multiply and divide. So I have essentially 1.30 liters times 194.5 divided by 297.7 equaling V2. And V2 should be somewhere approximately around 0.849 liters. Okay, so for our next gas law, we have Gay-Lussac's law. Now this might be one that you didn't cover in physical science in eighth grade, uh, but we have the direct proportionality between pressure and temperature in Kelvin represented by the equation P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. So again, we have a constant volume in this case and a constant number of particles. With this, you've probably seen something like a lot of the different aerosol cans that you would see will say something like contents under pressure, do not place into flames. This is why, because as you increase the temperature, you're gonna increase the number of collisions, and I hope that makes sense, because you should hopefully know that as you heat up the particles, they're going to move faster. So I'm going to have more frequent collisions with the container walls to the point where eventually they would explode. So we have to have Kelvin temperature again, degrees Celsius plus 273. You can see here as a uh, graph, we have the pressure in kilopascals versus temperature with a bunch of points plotted. And you'll notice again that I have a nice linear function with the pressure versus the temperature. So I have that direct proportion, so I know it's gonna be divided. P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. So for this next example problem, it's asking us to determine the new pressure if a gas at 3.5 atmospheres and 400 Kelvin has the temperature increase to 650 Kelvin. So same thing, I would have P1 over T1 Oops, T1 equals P2 over T2. I have already my temperatures in Kelvin, so I don't have to do any conversions on this one. So I'd have 3.50 ATMs divided by 400 Kelvin equals the second pressure, and we had 650 Kelvin. So once again, cross multiply there. So I'd have 3.50 ATMs multiplied by 650 Kelvin divided by 400 Kelvin equals P2. And we would end up with an answer. Let's see, we need two, let's see, one significant figure. So you'd have 5.69 atmospheres initially, but because the 400 only has one significant figure, we would round our answer to exactly six atmospheres. The next one that we're going to look at is Avogadro's law, and that shows us the relationship between volume and moles when we have a constant pressure and temperature. Now, for Avogadro's law, the easiest thing relationship-wise for you to think about is blowing up a balloon. So as I add more particles inside, I'm increasing the number of moles. And with each breath, the volume of the balloon expands. 
So when we talk about this, again, directly proportional to each other. So as I increase the number of moles, I will increase the volume as a result. You can see that in the little graph here. I'm changing my number of moles from 1 to 2 to 3. And you can see here, anytime that you see something about a flexible container versus a rigid container, the flexible container means that you are going to have the volume adjust to keep a constant pressure. So in this case, in order to keep the pressure constant, the size of the container is going to continue to increase. So that way we have, even though we have more particles colliding with the container to produce the higher pressure, because we're expanding the distance apart, it's going to lower the collision frequency until it's the same value that it was initially with one mole instead of three. So you can see that relationship take place within this container. Now, if I have a rigid container, that means that I have a constant volume instead of constant pressure. Oops. So I'd have a constant volume, which means that as you add particles, that will cause changes. I'm going to use the triangle there for changes in pressure. So flexible containers, your volume is going to adjust to keep the pressure constant. A rigid container would have a constant volume, so you're going to have changes in pressure taking place. So if we look at an example now for Avogadro's law, I have 2.45 moles of argon gas occupying 89.0 liters. What will the volume be if 2.10 moles of argon occupy under the same conditions of temperature and pressure? So same type of concept. I have two sets of moles. So there are my N values, N1 and N2, and I have a V1. So I can now set up v1 over n1 equals v2 over n2 so as i'm setting my problem up i have 89.0 liters divided by the 2.45 moles and that's going to be equal to the second volume over 2.10 moles and we should hopefully get an answer of V2 equaling 76.3. We have 3, 3, and 3 for our significant figures. So 76.3 will work. So now our combined gas law, our last one, it's just kind of like what it sounds. We have the pressure, volume, and temperature relationships with each other for a fixed quantity of gas. So I'm just going to write that off here to the side. We have a fixed quantity of gas, which means that my moles are constant. So the number of particles are inside the same, still have the same relationships. Pressure and volume are inversely proportional. Pressure and temperature, volume and temperature, both directly proportional. So that gives us an equation, P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. Temperature, again, for any of these problems must be found in Kelvin. And again, lowest temperature possible is zero degrees Celsius for the absolute zero. So if we now look at an example problem, we have... A child goes to an amusement park and receives 4.5 liter helium balloon at a pressure of 103 kilopascals when the temperature is 32 degrees Celsius. What will the, the new volume of the balloon be when it is brought into a house at 22 degrees Celsius and 101 kilopascals? So in this case, I have two different temperatures. So there's my T2. Here's my T1. I have a V1. I have a P1 and a P2. Five out of the six variables are listed. I need to convert my temperatures. So I have 32.0 degrees Celsius plus 273. And that should be equal to 305 Kelvin. My T2, I have 22.0 degrees Celsius plus the 273. So I have 295 as the Kelvin for T2.
Now, at this point, I'm ready to plug in. So I have my P1 value, 103 kilopascals. We have the initial volume, 4.50 liters. And we're going to divide that by the initial temperature, 305 Kelvin. That's equal to the new pressure, 101 kilopascals, times the V2, and divided by the 295 Kelvin. So I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by 295 Kelvin. And then I'm going to divide each one by the 101 kilopascals. So that will cancel those. Take that, divide it by 101 kPa. And let's see what we get. And it should be 4.43 liters. Let's see how many sig figs we need. So 333, three, three, those would be 4. So actually I should have had 305.0 and 295.0. My apologies on that. Let me add that in here just to be consistent with our sig figs because rules for addition and subtraction are different, if you recall. So I have that and that. There we go. Okay, I feel better now. All right, so we're going to do one last practice problem for this video. And it asks us, we have two balloons. The volume of neon is twice the volume of the argon. Which of the following best represents the mass ratio of neon to argon in the balloons? So hopefully you remember, we talked about Avogadro's law briefly. So we have the volume divided by the number of moles of the initial substances being equal to the second volume times the second number of moles. So knowing this relationship that the volume of the NE is twice the volume of the AR, that would tell us that the number of moles of NE is two times the number of moles of AR. So now the key to this is that it's asking us about mass. So the mass of neon off your periodic table, 20.18 grams per mole. But again, I know that neon is twice as large as argon. So I'm gonna assume that I'd have two moles of neon instead of one. So that would give me a mass of approximately 40.36. For the argon, Again, because that is a mass, a volume of one, we can look its molar mass up and we get 39.95 grams per mole. And we're only going to multiply this by one. So that would be equal to 39.95. Hopefully you can tell 40, 39.95, they're very close to each other. So the most appropriate answer for this would be that the masses would be the same. Watch out for these types of things because in a lot of the problems that you'd see on your test and multiple choice sections, they may change it up to mole ratio instead, and that would make it a completely different answer to the problem. So be very careful, underlying keywords in your problem. But that wraps up the initial video on the uh, basic gas laws. Your next video, we will start getting into the ideal gas law where we start to involve moles in the calculations and its derivations and Dalton's law of partial pressures. Have a great evening.